As you're turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, let me uh, refer you back to chapter 2. Uh, remember Nebuchadnezzar's dreams that he had, and, and uh, there was that great metallic image, and, and uh, God had given him a prophetic picture of the next two and a half millennia of uh, Daniel's future. And um, his empire was only to last, as great and expansive as the Babylonian empire was, it was only to last 66 years. And it was followed by the Persians, who we were introduced to last week, uh, who would rule the world for a little over 200 years. And then Alexander the Great is going to come. He was the um, um, bronze thighs that would come later, uh, or the bronze torso. Uh, and then the Romans would take over and expanding their uh, dominance for the next. Depending upon how you start the Roman Empire and how you end it, uh, historians are somewhat uh, different on that, but... Uh, next six, uh, uh, 650 years at least. Uh, and then this last empire that, uh, uh, whoops, <laughs> the last empire that we see here is the revived Roman Empire. That's kind of the name that most uh, um, historians and contemporary geopoliticians have uh, um, prescribed to it is uh, the revived Roman Empire. But the head of gold has fallen, and now the chest of silver uh, has taken over. And we ended up uh, last time in chapter 5 of verse 31 where it said, uh, Daniel the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And it pleased Darius, or Darius, depending upon whether you're left-handed or right-handed, uh, to be set over the kingdom, or to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, there were three governors. And over these, three... Uh, 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 over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Uh, now, secular historians say there's no record of anybody by the name of Darius or Darius. Uh, and he's most likely identified with a guy from secular history known as Gubaru or Cyraxeres. Uh, and he died about six months after Cyrus, who was the head of the Persian Empire, uh, after he took over from the Babylonians, Darius died. And uh, so this would probably be right shortly before his death because he's been there. He was placed by Cyrus over Babylon, uh, and he would have been there long enough to have gained uh, Daniel's confidence and, and respect, and, and or Cyrus would have gotten Daniel's, and, and he would have... Uh, uh, given him this prominence over, uh, as a governor over uh, a third of the Persian Empire. If you got the old King James, the word governor is translated as presidents. So Daniel was the prez of Babylon, if you will. Uh, and he says that he did so. He had these three guys to whom all these satraps, 120 satraps, which is basically a governor, uh, and these guys reported to the governors, and then that way, why that way, Cyrus would suffer no loss. Uh, Old King James says he would suffer no damage. Uh, he didn't want to lose any tax revenue is what that was all about. And it says, When Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So he was already the prez over a third of it, and uh, the king was thinking about maybe setting him over the entire thing and just kind of, being his vizier, if you will, or his chief administrator, who would report only uh, to the king. It says that he had an excellent spirit. Uh, I think that's a Bible guy why, uh, way of just saying that he had this really positive, good attitude about things. You know, he wasn't a complainer. Uh, he he uh, didn't see the negative side of things. He uh, wasn't always trying to make things different for himself. He was just, he has, he, he was positive. He had an excellent spirit about him. He had a good attitude. And so the rest of the guys that were part of the kingdom felt a little threatened by him. And they say in verse 4 that the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. 
you know, they tried to find something that they could bring a charge with him and uh, against him, and they couldn't. You know, one of the things, and every time, you know, we're finding ourselves in a presidential election cycle now, and, and one of the things that I hear him say every time, I've seen several of these in my lifetime, and they always say that the longer somebody is in political office, the more dirt the, the um, his, his uh, 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 guys that are against him can find, you know, his, his uh, uh, guys that are running uh, against him. And uh, because the longer in an office, the more stuff that they have. Um, you know, every time a president comes into office and they start trying to um, put judges or any kind of a... Uh, um, somebody in, into office, and then they have the Senate confirmation hearings. And, of course, those just what they turn into anymore is just this whole thing about all the muckraking and, and just all the uh, stuff that they can dig up on the person, whether they're true or not. And it's just all about trying to politically slam everybody in office. Uh, you remember the old Dear Abby uh, column, and somebody wrote in to Dear Abby one time and said, uh, I've, uh, I've always... I've always wanted to have my family history traced, but I can't afford to spend a lot of money on it. Any suggestions? Signed, Sam. And so Abby responded back to him, and, and he says, Dear Sam, yes, run for public office. Uh, you know, that'll get your family history checked out real quickly. Um, but Daniel was a guy with an excellent spirit. He was a man of impeccable integrity. And I think if we look at Daniel as our example, we can find uh, four earmarks. There are four things that we can point to that we can say are the earmarks of uh, a person of integrity. Uh, four earmarks of integrity. And you can write these down because I'm going to put them up here on the screen for you. One is an excellent spirit, as it says in verse 3. Uh, that means somebody that has a very positive attitude, as I said. is somebody that's always forward-thinking, and always, he's the guy that you just want to be around. He's a guy that you, when you see him coming, you know, there are those that you don't, you ask somebody how they're doing, and as soon as the words come out of your mouth, you wish you could take it back, because you know they're going to tell you, you know. But Daniel was a guy that you would love to ask how he's doing, because he would just brighten your day in the process. Um, first earmark of integrity is an excellent spirit. Second one is a man of faithfulness, as it says in verse 4. Solomon writes in Proverbs 26, most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? You know, everybody wants to talk about how uh, faithful they are, uh, what a man of integrity they are, but who can really find one that uh, uh, measures up and cuts the mustard? Um, number three, somebody who's blameless, also in verse four. You know, somebody who... Uh, you know, Jesus says the world's going to hate you because it hates me, so don't be surprised if it does. The world hates me because of who I am. The world's going to hate you because of who you are, because you love me. The world is always looking for uh, some way to point a finger at you and say, and you call yourself a Christian. Uh, we just want to make sure that we don't fuel that. You know, we know they're going to, but we don't want to do anything that's going to uh, just hand it to them. Uh, you know, Daniel was the kind of guy that when he would be riding his chariot home at night, and he'd be getting home late, you know, because a long day at the office, and he'd be getting home about 11 o'clock, and as he would turn into his edition, it was a nice, quiet, residential edition, but you get about a block or two into it, and there was this four-way stop sign. Well, no traffic at 11 o'clock at night. You could see if anybody was coming by their headlights from, you know, you can see them from blocks away. There's no, there's no real reason to come to a complete stop. You know, you could come to a pretty much stop. Uh, you could come to a kind of, you could come to what they used to call the California stop. You know, you could do that, and that would be good enough. I mean, what's wrong with that? Uh, it's not dangerous. And here were Daniel's enemies. Here were his, his guys that were just kind of looking at some way to take him down, and they're hiding behind the elm tree, just about a, quarter of a block up the street, just waiting for him to come in with his chariot, just knowing that he's going to come to a, a rolling stop and then keep on going, and they can jump out from behind their tree and point their finger at him and say, Aha, gotcha. But Daniel stopped. You know, he stopped. He came to a complete stop. 
and then looked both ways before he proceeded. Do we even want to talk about speed limits? Do, do we even want to? Do, is that? Do we want to go there? Uh, I mean, I, I know that when they post the speed limit and they say, you know, the speed limit is 45 miles an hour, what they really mean is 50 miles an hour because they know everybody's going to go 50. So they write 45 so that that way they give you that five miles that they would be giving you if they actually wrote it down. But they, they know you're going to do that anyway. So they just say 35 so you'll go 40. Uh, but then if you go, you know, five miles an hour, they just expect that. But then, you know, what's a mile or two an hour here or there? You know, what's wrong with if you can go five miles? What's wrong with seven miles or even eight miles? Makes sense to me, you know. Daniel went 44 in the 45. He, he, he did not do anything. He did not compromise. He didn't push the envelope. He was blameless. He was blameless in the movies that he watched and the music that he listened to. You could check his Internet history any time, and it would have been spotless. Because he was blameless. Daniel wasn't sinless. Okay? He was conceived in sin just like all the rest of us. He was a sinner because he was a sinner by nature and by practice. But he's the only person in the Bible that we don't have any account. The Bible doesn't record any record of his sin. Uh, some people say Joseph too, but at least Daniel, we got to know that there was you can't point a finger at him in any category because he was blameless. And then last, number four, is that he had a consistent walk with God. We'll see this in verse 10. You know, he was the same on Monday as he was on Sunday. Or Saturday, as I guess the case would have been. Uh, he was the same on Sunday as he was on Saturday. Uh, you know, he wasn't one person at church and then another person when he was at home. He wasn't one person when he was in his Shabbat class and then another person when he was at work. Um, he was consistent in his walk with God. Uh, he was a man of integrity. And so these guys find themselves in a dilemma. they got a problem. And, and they say, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You know, and he says, no, the only way we're going to be able to bring any charge against him, the only way we're going to get any traction in our case against Daniel, is to find it in his relationship with God. Because when it comes to being a citizen, when it comes to being a regular guy, when it comes to being a subject of Darius, he's got it going on. You know, uh, the story is told about this funeral where uh, they'd gone to the funeral and, and this guy had died and, and uh, you know, the family sitting up there on the front row and, and the preacher was there in the pulpit and he was starts off, you know, talking about what a good man this guy was and he started talking about all the, the just what a man of integrity and what a man of love and compassion and how much he cared for his family. And he just goes on and on. And after about 10 minutes of this, the mom elbows one of the children and said, go up there and look in that casket and see if that's your pa. Uh, you know, Daniel was this kind of guy that would, when they said he was a good man, he was a good man. You know, the world's always going to find a, uh, to, uh, find a way to point a finger. But we got to remember, I mean, this is, Daniel was probably about 15 at the time of the captivity. The 70 years has passed. So he's going to be in his uh, mid-70s, late 70s, maybe early 80s by this time. He's got a lot of time in office where he could have... I mean, this, he's got a lot of time. You know, there, there, there's a lot of record. There's a lot of voting. There's a, there's a lot of uh, rulings. There's a lot of things that he has done in his capacity as being one of the main guys in the empire, and yet they come to the conclusion that the only way they would ever be able to find some way of bringing an accusation against him would be if they could do it with his religion. You know, somebody could say, well, yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying, and as I've read Daniel 6 before, and I know all about his story and everything, but you don't know what it's like for me. I mean, you don't know what it's like to work where I work. I work at Pagan Inc., and you don't know what that's like down there. And I would admit I don't. I've, I've never been to Pagan Inc., and I don't, I, I don't know what that would be like. Uh, and you've probably got a, a, a case. I don't think it was quite as bad as working for a pagan emperor, though. You know, you say, yeah, but you don't, you don't know what it's like living with my wife. Or with my husband. I mean, it's just intolerable. 
she is insufferable. He is just unbelievable in the way that he treats me. I get that. I understand. You don't know what it was growing up like it was for me, what it was like growing up. I mean, I just, the, the background that I came from, the sort of abuse that I underwent as a child, you don't know what it's like having the environment that I have to be in and was in every day of my life, and it continues even up till today. Well, Daniel was in the most depraved culture imaginable. He had every reason to turn his back on God. He had every reason to live for himself. He had every reason to try to say, nobody's looking out for me except me. I'm going to have to do it myself. And as I said, as, as Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were in the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Jesus says, I know what it's like in the world. Remember, that's I came from there too. The world's going to hate you. The world's going to point a finger. The world's going to try to tear you down. And Daniel didn't get on a soapbox. You know, he didn't blog about it. He didn't get on Facebook and count his woes. He just lived. So it says in verse 6 that these governors and the satraps thronged before David and said thus to him, King Darius... No king rocks like you rock. Uh, you know, they come, they come into him. In fact, the, the word throng is the word ragash. And uh, remember, this means a tumultuous throng. You know, this isn't just a bunch of people. This is a tumultuous bunch of people. And it says they came in, and, and we're going to see this repeatedly throughout the chapter, but they, they came in and they thronged the king, and they said, Oh, King Darius, you're the best. Live forever. And all the governors of the kingdoms and the administrators and the satraps and the counselors and the advisors, so it was all of them. I mean, every, from the dog catcher all the way up to the chairman of the Senate. They've consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, the lion's den was, has, has become historically known as that was the Persians' guillotine. You know, that was the, the Persians' cross. Uh, that, that was their way of execution. Was They would throw uh, people into a lion's den. And they kept their lions good and hungry. You know, they wanted, to, they wanted to make sure that when somebody got thrown into the den that they would be made short work of. And so whoever makes a petition, whoever asks anything from anybody, whether it's a man or a God, whoever asks anything from anybody except for you for the next month, let them be thrown into the uh, lion's den. And now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Now, a couple things about this. First thing, what a stupid decree. I mean, this is, is really kind of, I mean, who would want that kind of responsibility? You know, I wouldn't want for 30 days to have it just in of Calvary Chapel of Oklahoma City that everybody that's a member of this church could not do anything unless they asked my permission and got my advice first. You know, could you imagine the entire Persian Empire no one can do anything unless they come and bring it to you for that. I mean, that's just the, just at the surface. It's a very stupid kind of decree. Uh, but secondly, another thing I want you to notice is that this would be done according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. And if you remember when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the king, he was absolute sovereign. He was the complete monarch. If he said this is going to be the law, that was the law. And if he woke up the next morning and changed his mind, then he changed his mind. Uh, and there was no, not anybody that could ever in any way question it or challenge it. Uh, but now we find that the Persians have kind of advanced a little bit, and they have what they call the rule of law. And if, if the uh, Persian emperor, if the Persian king signs something into law, then he can't change it. I imagine probably at the root of this was the idea that, well, that would kind of make the king sound like he was wishy-washy, and if it was a good idea, he wouldn't want to change it, and if it was a good idea, he it wasn't a good idea, he wouldn't have signed it in the law in the first place. That's probably what was behind it, but here's the law, and he says it's the law of the Medes and the Persians, which doesn't alter. It can't be altered. Once it's been put into effect, it can't be changed. 
um, no one could change it. Because no longer was the king sovereign, but the rule of law was sovereign. And so, verse 9, therefore King Darius signed the written decree. Now, from all appearances, Darius is a pretty good guy. You know, he appears to, he's got a genuine love for uh, Daniel. He gives some pretty good lip service, at the very least, for God uh, at the end of it. He seems like he's a pretty good guy. Why would he write into effect, why would he sign such a stupid decree as that? Our egos are Satan's most willing accomplices. <laughs> you know what? Uh, and no matter how, and by the way, this, this is why human monarchies, human mon monarchies don't work. Because we, our egos are subject to Satan's temptations. And no matter how good the monarch might be, he's still going to fail because he's a sinner. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, I mean, I, if you think about it, though, the only thing wrong with a monarchy is the monarch. I mean, it's a pretty good way of government, really. I mean, I love the United States. I love our Republican form of government. And I, I think it's the best thing that has ever happened on earth so far. But it's not the most efficient. You know, it takes years to get a good law into effect. And it takes even longer to get a bad one out. Uh, you know, it's not a very effective way of getting things done. But imagine if you had a king that wasn't subject to his ego, who wasn't fallen? What if you had an absolute monarch who was perfect? That'd be a pretty good kingdom, wouldn't it? Well, the day is coming when Jesus will rule over such a kingdom. So a monarchy is a really good way of ruling things. You just got to have the right guy in, on the throne. And, and one day, King Jesus will be on the throne. And he'll rule over human government. But until that thing, thing happens, we'll have situations like Daniel chapter 6. And said, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, check this out. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he knew this law had been uh, put together by all these uh, guys in, in uh, uh, Darius' administration, and then he had signed it. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. And if, uh, I, I encourage you to underline the last part of this verse, as was his custom since early days. From the, from the time that Daniel had a window to open toward Jerusalem, he had gotten down on his knees three times a day and prayed toward the city. Uh, this is probably based upon, and Daniel was a man of the word, and he would have known of this. If you remember uh, back in 1 Kings when the temple was first built, when Solomon was king and he built the temple, and when he dedicated the temple, Dan, uh, Solomon had a really cool prayer that he prayed at the, at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. And we'll just quickly go through it, uh, starting with verse 46, 1 Kings eight forty-six, And it says, And when they, meaning the Israelites, when they sin against you, for there's no one who doesn't sin, and you become angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far and near, Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, We've sinned and done wrong, and we've committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the temple which you have built for your name, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and supplication and maintain their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you and grant them compassion before those who took them captive that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your inheritance whom you have brought out of Egypt, out of the fire, iron furnace, that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you. So Daniel would have been familiar with 1 Kings chapter 8 when Solomon made this prayer about when this happens and the people would repent and they would look toward Jerusalem and they would look toward the temple and they would pray for your forgiveness. And Daniel is doing what Samuel had prayed in 1 Kings 8. He was also probably uh, familiar with what uh, Psalm 55, 17 says where the psalmist says, Evening and morning at noon I will pray and cry aloud 
and he shall hear my voice. I'm going to do it in the morning, I'm going to do it in the evening, and I'm going to do it at noon. I'm going to pray towards you three times a day. Now, this I don't think this is saying that he's going to pray for his, uh, say, grace at breakfast, and then do it over his bologna sandwich at lunch, and then over his roast beef at dinner. You know, it's a, I'm, I'm sure Daniel did. Uh, I'm sure he did do that, but that's not what this is saying. Daniel, that's not what the psalmist is saying, and that's, I'm sure that's not what Daniel did, just simply when he prayed three times a day. He wasn't just simply saying grace. He was getting down on his knees and he was praising God and making supplication for his people. So he goes home, throws up in his window, gets down on his knees, and he prays toward Jerusalem. Let me ask a question. Would Daniel have sinned if he had kept the window closed? Would that have been a sin? I mean, there's no prohibition in the Scripture. You know, there's, there's nothing in Samuel's, or I'm sorry, Solomon's prayer that says anything about windows being open. There's no command in Scripture that says open your windows and pray to the east, pray toward Jerusalem, or I guess in this case it would have been to the west. Would that have been a sin if he had done that? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. You know, if for some reason it seems to me, I think I would be safe in saying that to Daniel it would have been sin. But if, if you had been in Daniel's place and just, okay, we're Daniel, we're men of integrity, we're, we're women of, of great spirit, and, and so this decree has been given, and so we get in our chariot and we go home and we throw up our windows and we fall down our knees, what's going to be our prayer? Oh God, I need you now, do something. They, this isn't right what they're doing to me. And the, the, you just need to intercede here. You need to intervene. You need to do something to stop what they're doing. But it says here that he, he gave thanks. Daniel got down on his knees and gave thanks. You know, he, 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 as he prayed, he wanted nothing more than God's will because he knew that God's will would be good. And so he He prays. He, he, I guess we could say he prayed a, a true prayer of faith, you know. And that was the pr that was the prayer. The prayer of faith is not telling God what to do, you know. God, I just I'm believing that you're going to heal me, and so you you heal me right now. And I'm just not accepting anything else other than that healing because I'm believing by faith that you're going to heal me. That's not a prayer of faith. That's a prayer of demand. Prayer of faith is the one that just says, God, here, I give this situation to you. you here, here it is, I place this in your hands, and I trust you for the outcome. That's the true prayer of faith, and Daniel prayed a prayer of faith. He, he, he gave this entire situation into the Lord's hands. And it, but it says here, and here were these guys, you know, they were half a block down, uh, down the street, and they had their binoculars and their telescopes out, and they are probably periscopes because they would have been hiding behind a uh, a ledge of some kind, you know, and, and, and it says they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. The word assembled here is that word regash again. Regash. It means a tumultuous gathering. This would have made a, you know, I, every time Hollywood makes a movie, they always have to change it. Have you, have you ever noticed that? They always have to tweak it. They always, somehow they think they're going to improve it by changing it. I just love the movie several years ago, that mini-series that they did uh, on Noah. And they, they had the, the big sea battle during the flood with, between Noah and Lot, you know? And somehow that made for a better story. Why don't they just tell... I mean, this would have made a good movie. This would have been a great story, wouldn't it? Just... just I mean, we already got the, the script right here. The movie script's all laid out for us. I'd have loved to have been the um, casting director... You know, be able to pick the cast for this. I mean, I would have, uh, for, for the, these guys, you know, it says they're tumultuous assembly. They, uh, they're, as they regashed, uh, uh, they came together and they, they uh, assembled, they regashed. I mean, I, I just, they, they, I, I would have cast uh, the Three Stooges, uh, Larry, Larry, Moe, and Curly, you know, because I just, every time they run into a place, they would bump into each other and they would, you know, whoop, 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 and poke them in the eyes and all this. I mean, I, I just think that's kind of, the way they would have regashed when they came uh, together. And so these guys were regashing, and they found Daniel praying. Uh, 
and making supplication. And so they went before the king and they spoke concerning the king's decree. He says, have you not signed the decree that every man who petitions any god or man within three days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, yeah, it's true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which it doesn't alter. And so they answered before the king and they said, well, that Daniel, you know, not, not Daniel, but that Daniel, you know, that Daniel, the one who is of the captives of Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. There's three times a day that he's asking some God besides you, some man besides you. He makes his request three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. He realized that he had been had by these guys because it says that uh, he, he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until the going down of the sun to deliver him. He loved Daniel. You know, he didn't want to throw Daniel into the lion's den, but it was the law of the Medes and Persians which couldn't be altered. And so he spent the whole rest of the day trying to figure out some way that he could find a loophole in this loophole decree. And then these men approached, and there's the word regash again. So, boop, 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 you know. Uh, these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, and no decree or statute with the king, which the king establishes may be changed. You know, we see this also coming to play in the book of Esther when Haman gets that uh, law that there's going to be a day when it's open season on the Jews. Um, and the king couldn't undo that. And the only way he could uh, counteract it was to come up with a law that would make it open season on, on everybody but the Jews uh, and give the Jews a chance to defend themselves. But he says, you've, you've done this, and there's no way it can be, uh, you can back out of it. So the king gave the command, verse uh, 16, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now, I have no reason to believe, at least at this point, that Darius was a believer in the sense of being a monotheist, a monotheistic God worshiper. God -worshiper. I don't have any reason to think that. He was probably uh, a, a polytheist, a uh, pagan worshiper, just like every other Persian uh, would have been. Uh, but I, I, I have find that some people, when they find themselves in a very dire situation and they don't know what else to do, they don't know what else to say, they'll say something religious. <laughs> you know? and, and so as he, he's saying, well, you know, I hate to do this to you, Dan, uh, that I got to throw you in the lion's pit, but Romans eight twenty eight, you know, uh, don't worry about it because uh, God will deliver you. What they Genesis fifty twenty, what they have intended for evil, God intends for good. So don't sweat it; it's all going to be okay. And and uh, you know <laughs> what probably was the case though as we see of Daniel so far, as the king was saying this to him, you know, I, I, of course, I don't think the king was saying that. He didn't know about Genesis 50, 20, and Romans 8, 28 hadn't been written yet. But it was probably Daniel, as he was saying, oh, Daniel, I'm so sorry to have to do this to you, but I got to kill you, you know. And Daniel saying, don't sweat it, king. What they intend for evil, God's going to intend for good. You know, it's all going to be okay. Let me encourage you. You know, Daniel's motto was, I am invincible until God says otherwise. And that's not a bad motto, is it? I mean, that would be something that would that, make a good bumper sticker. We, we could get that needle pointed. And so a, a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. And then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. You know, he didn't get his nighttime lullaby, and also his sleep went from him. So he went back to the palace that night, and he just couldn't get any sleep. He was so worried about Daniel. Now, I imagine Daniel was probably getting some pretty good Z's. You know, he was probably pretty chillaxed. 
But the king it says the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out lamenting in a, with a lamenting voice to Daniel. And the king spoke to Daniel, saying, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the den of lions? Been able to deliver you from the lions? Now, I don't think Daniel was a pretty straight arrow, but I don't think he was a stuffed shirt. And I could picture him having some fun with this. You know, Daniel, are you okay? Daniel? Daniel, are you okay? And then finally, uh, he, he just said, psych, you know. Um, I could see Daniel doing something like that. But he, he, he goes to him, and Daniel says, oh, king, live forever. You know, there was no hard feelings. There was no animosity against the guys who had done this to him, no animosity against the king. I mean, you gave Daniel, you know, he was thinking, well, either God will save me or he won't. It's kind of the same... Uh, process that his uh, homies had back in chapter 2, isn't it? He can deliver us, whether he will or not, he's going to deliver us from you. Whether we die or come back or stay alive. Story told about Corey Timboom. Remember her? She was the World War II uh, labor camp survivor and had a tremendous ministry way up into her 80s. And she has tells a story about when she went to a doctor kind of in her, her later years. And she was getting a checkup, and the doctor said, i got some kind of bad news for you. You've got this minor uh, heart thing, and, and it could be fixed by a very simple procedure. We could fix it. You could get several more years left. Or if you don't do anything, you're, you're probably not going to live very much longer. And, and so she thought about it, and she said, let me get this straight. If I do this simple procedure that you're saying, I can probably live for another 10 or 15 years. But if I don't, then I'll probably die pretty soon. And the doctor said, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And she said, well, let me pray about it, and I'll get back to you. You know, she was stuck between two options. Okay, do I live longer on earth, or do I go home and be with God? Hmm, I don't know which I'd choose. Uh, this is kind of where Daniel was. This was his whole approach to life. And, and, and it, you know, he, if he was given the option, he didn't know. So he just said, well, how about I just put it in God's hands? You know, Unfortunately, I think many, and I, I hesitate to say most, but I think many of us, even as Christians, we, we kind of live as though this life is the most important, that if we can do everything that we can preserve, uh, do to preserve health and wealth while we're here on this earth, then we've got this assurance that when we die, we can go to heaven. Uh, but we do everything we can to put that off as long as we can. And, um, you know, it's just uh, the way so many Christians act is though that Christianity is just simply hedging their bets, you know? Like, well, I just don't want to die. I don't want to leave home without it, so I'm going to make sure I got my, my Christianity card, you know? Is it possible for someone to be so heavenly-minded that they're no earthly good? The world would tell you so. Um, but I would say not. I would say what we need is a lot more heavenly-minded people, that the world would be a whole lot better place if more people were heavenly-minded. We'd have a lot better time here before we got there if we were more heavenly-minded. I would agree, though, that you can be so religiously-minded that you're no earthly good. I think a lot of people would kind of fill those shoes. Um, but it's not... I don't think it's possible to be heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. He says in verse 22, My God sent his angel to shut the mouths, the lion's mouths, so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. You know, just so there's no misunderstanding as we tout Daniel's faithfulness, it wasn't Daniel's faithfulness that saved him. Okay? It was God's. <laughs> God was faithful. And even though Daniel was faithful, that's not what saved him. It was, it was, it was, God didn't say, well, I'm going to do this because you've been a man with an excellent spirit, because you've been faithful, and, and because you've had this 70-year administration 
uh, with the emperor and you haven't done anything wrong, so I'm going to reward you by that for that by stopping the lion's mouth. That's not why God did that. He did it because he's God. And so just so we understand that, that doesn't take away from Daniel's testimony and Daniel's example, but, but it, it is God's faithfulness that saved him. And, and he, he says, it was my God, Lord. He came and he stopped the mouth, the lion's mouth. I don't know how he did that. You know, he brought an angel. Uh, I don't know how many lions there were. I don't know how many hands, hands an angel would have to, you know, hold the lion's mouth shut at the same time. But he's doing that while the uh, angel was doing that while Daniel was sleeping. And he says, verse 23 and the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And so the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and they broke all their bones in pieces before they ever became, before they ever came to the bottom of the lion or bottom of the den. You think, well, I can understand why you would want to throw all these guys, the, the 120 satraps and the three other governors, or the two other governors, I can see why you'd want to throw them in there, but why their wives and why their children? That seems harsh. That doesn't seem, why didn't God intervene on behalf of the innocent people? Um, and I don't know that I know the full answer to that, other than that there's no such thing as an innocent person totally. But I think a more appropriate answer is to understand that there's, you know, we, we, we live in a culture today where uh, so many people talk about victimless crimes and victimless sins. And there's no such thing. You know, there's no such thing as a victimless sin. There's no such thing to say, well, I just, you know, what I do uh, doesn't hurt anybody but myself. And that's not true. You know, I, I read something recently where it says that more money is spent on pornography than the combined income of every major league professional ball player in America. All of them combined. The salaries of all of the major leagues combined is less than gets spent on pornography. And, and that's generally considered to be the victimless crime. You know, well, you know, she, the girl already took the picture, and so I'm not hurting her by looking at it. And, and, I mean, it's in the privacy of my own room. It doesn't hurt anybody. What my wife doesn't know doesn't hurt her. And, and that's hogwash. You know, there is no such thing as a victim of sin. Our sins always affect others. If, if I look at pornography, it's going to affect the way I look at my wife. And it's going to affect the way that I look at other people. And, and there's no such thing as a victim of sin. Uh, our sins always affect other people. And these guys' sins, all 122 of them, Affected 122 wives and how many children? And they all uh, paid the price for it. And so then King Darius, Darius wrote to all peoples. This sounds very much like uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's testimony after chapter 5, doesn't it? And very similar. To all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. I don't know if Darius was saved before chapter 5 or chapter 6, but I'm pretty sure he's saved by the end of it. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? In John chapter 20, Jesus has already appeared to the ten disciples. You know, Judas has killed himself, and, then, and, and Thomas had gone down to the on queue for a hot dog. And, and while he was gone, Jesus appeared to the other ten. And when Thomas came back, they all said, Hey, guess what, Tom? Jesus was here. He said, Unless I can put my hands in his, uh, the holes in his fingers, and, in, or my fingers in the hole of his hands, and my, in the spear of it, in his side, I'm not going to believe. And then all of a sudden, ta-da, there was Jesus, you know. And, he, well, here I am, Thomas, believed. And he fell down. He said, my Lord and my God. And, and Jesus says, you know, blessed are you. This is 2029, uh, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
you know, we can we can be like Thomas and hold out for the two by four. We can be like Darius and hold out for the two by four. We can be that way if we want to, but it's usually not very advisable. I don't know if you've ever been hit by a two by four or not, but they're pretty painful. You know, if God wants me, you're just going to hit me upside the head with a two by four. You don't want that. I mean, there is a, there is an easier option. There is a better way. And I, I it's not I, I'm not an advocate of blind faith. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I don't. There's no such thing as blind faith. I think faith is blind, is not faith. It's kind of I don't know what it is, but it's not faith. But there's an easy way, and there's a hard way. Um, and uh, I think God would. It would just be a whole lot better to take the easy way. And take the evidence that's been given to us and then surrender to God and not have to uh, go through the, the hard course. And it says, so this Daniel, you know, that Daniel that the, the guys were talking about, that Mary, Larry Moore and Curley were talking about, that Daniel, well, this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in, and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And this is the last that we'll hear about Darius. Um, but not the last that we're here of Daniel. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are present when we're faithful, and we thank, thank you that you are present when we're not. We thank you that your will is done when we do the right thing, and your will is done when we don't. We want to be the ones that do the right thing. God, we, we want to be found faithful. We want to be the person that... Uh, uh, be men and women of integrity at all times, not just simply when somebody's looking, because you're always looking, and not just simply because we fear your judgment. While that would be worthy enough, but we want to just do it because it's your will to do right, because you have done so right by us. So God, by your Spirit, through by His power and through the revelation of your Word, may we do so. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Questions or comments? Oh, Lawrence?